Hey guys, Pastor Ryan Hurt here at LBC. I'm so excited that you've tuned in to listen to this message. But before we begin, I would ask that if you've been blessed by LBC or these sermons, that you might consider giving back to us so that we can continue to put out these resources to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, both here in Lingaville and the world abroad. You can give on this app or website. As happy as that we are that you have tuned in, we do ask that this does not take the place of being a part of the local church, and we encourage all folks to be a part of the local body. We are gl glad to provide this sermon for you, and I pray that this message helps you and you're growing in Jesus Christ. Blessings. Um, I'm so excited about um, today, so excited about our conversation that we're going to have, but I always want to make sure. we got a lot of first time, obviously we got a lot of people um, that are coming, and I know that, that for a lot of us we've been kind of in and out in the summer. Maybe you're a first time guest, uh, but we've been in this sermon series ultimately. It's called Recalculating, and it's Man, what happens when our faith is going one way and life goes the other? Um, and let's be honest, we all got a story of recalculating faith, moments in our story where we were going this way and now we're going this way. And, and this is where we've been in the summer months. We've been looking at um, scriptures. We've been looking at the, the tree that falls across the row. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 has kind of been the basis of this um, sermon series. But these moments in life that happen um, that, that make our faith go backwards. A phone call comes, uh, cancer happens, death happens, divorce happens, um, something rears its ugly head, and our faith is rocked to the core. Um, and, and how we are as a body of Christ going to respond in these moments. And, and, and the challenge has been that, that we would quit being identified by extreme ups and extreme downs. So like when everything's good, we love Jesus, we're getting all the tattoos, everything's cool, but man, the moment the phone call comes, we don't like God, we're an atheist, we're never going to go to church again. Um, but that we would find like this place in our faith to go, God, you're good on the mountaintops, and God, you're good in the valleys, um, because what defines me is Jesus and nothing else, regardless of what this life throws at me. And so this is the end goal in this conversation, uh, in this sermon series. Um, and so uh, we're just going to have another uh, conversation today, um, and I'm joined uh, today by, for those of you that don't already know him, uh, Charlie Crawford. Uh, Charlie Crawford is... Um, a, a known name in the rodeo world. Um, but can we just give him a big hand um, for being here today? Um, but what we've been doing, again, if you're a first-time guest, is I've been preaching some, um, and then we just have these kind of eject buttons to go, hey, let's have a real-life conversation with someone who's been in this place. Um, it, it's kind of given me a break this summer not to have to preach every single Sunday, and so it's been nice on one hand. But it's also been cool to see the power of Revelation 12 that says that they'll know us by the, the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. And what we've seen through this summer series, man, there's, there's power in people sharing their story. There's power opening your mouth and as hard as it's going to be, and Charlie will talk about that in a moment, to tell your story because God's going to send people in your path that need to hear your story. Not a sermon on Sunday. They need to hear your testimony and how Jesus intervened into your story. And so it's just been a cool way to, to we're going to preach, we're going to throw some grenades out there. Hey, here's what the scripture say, and then let's have a conversation. So that's what we are doing today. But before we get going any further, Charlie, I'm going to have you introduce your, your family here um, is on the screen. Well, I'd like to start off by saying, too, is what beautiful music. Man, those were some great songs. And when you sang about, I've been to the bottom and I've been to the top, it makes me wonder, have you really not rodeoed? Because it sounds like you really have. <laughs> it's a Pastor great song. Life. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's me in the white hat, obviously. Um, I used to have my own stats. Uh, I actually used to think I wrote pretty good and thought I made a name for myself. Well, then I got married, and then I turned into Jackie Crawford's husband, so <laughs> that's me. And you just got a yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my little man, Creed Crawford. That's my little sheepdog down there. He takes care of the girls for me while I'm gone, and... I always liked names that had, had some meaning to it, and so we named him Creed because I wanted to be strong in his beliefs. And then my little sweetheart, Journey, on my right arm, she, uh, she was kind of the milestone with me and Jackie to where when Breakaway was taken off and her journey was to become a Breakaway Roper out there in the world when, when uh, Breakaway was now starting to get mainstream and where my career was coming to an end and I was going on a new path and a new journey in my life. So she's, she's kind of our, our milestone. Uh, Cadence wasn't there. This was during the, the NFR for Jackie last year, but that's, that's my family. Cadence, she's off there trying to make a name for herself out there, break win right now. So nice. that's my family. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we, as we get into this, I think the very first question that, that I want to camp out around is, is your relationship with Jesus. Um, were you raised up in the faith? 
And then if you weren't raised up in the faith, how did you come, how'd you come to know Jesus? So I came from a very dysfunctional family. Um, my dad was married to his wife, and then he met my mom, and then nine men, or uh, so he was married to his wife, and then he met my mom at a beer tent, and then nine months later, how do y'all, here I am. <laughs> and so that was the, the, how my environment was raised growing up. Uh, you know, I had my mom over there on one side of the Pee Wee Rodeo Arena, and my my dad and his wife and family over there on the other and grew up being a real insecure kid. Um, you know, a lot of things saying behind your back, you know, as you grow up in that kind of environment. And I, uh, my dad didn't go to church. He was the love and drink and fight and cowboy era. And my mom went to church, but I wouldn't say that she was really in, in the word. It was more of went to church because I think it was a thing to do. But either way, that's what got me in church. And if it wasn't for my mom and, and got me in church and to at least implanted those seeds that was instilled in me at a young age. And thank God for that because the, the tour that I went from there was really rocky. But my, luckily there was, my mom knew my passion and I loved water as a young kid. I loved swimming. I loved, I loved uh, pools. I loved going swimming in the river and then the, and the swing with the tied the rope on the tree where we were able to slide in there and, and, and jump in the river and like I just loved it well there happened to be a, a bible camp that had all of those things it was right by a river had a pool and so she got me into that that bible camp at a young age and it, it at least let me have the understanding of knowing that that God was there there was a God and if thank my mom for that that that, that was instilled in me early because, man, along that path was, was so rocky. Um, you know, not knowing is what I call the, the teams going in, into, into life later on after that. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I grew up as a kid, idolizing rodeo was, was, a, was a thing for me. That was my passion. My passion was I wanted to be the best roper. I wanted to be a cowboy. I mean, it's just, it was so romantic to see guys out there on the road and doing what they want and the freedom and everything like that. And I was like, man, why would anybody want to do anything else? But not having a very strong faith led me to a lot of wrong roads, a lot of um, bad paths. And what I always kind of said was, you know, the, the rodeo and was basically my false idol. And it's, it's real easy to have that um, it's, it, I think whatever your passion is, is a good thing. That's right. I think it's really important to also understand is your passion can't be your idol. And so there is that fine line. And I like what First John 5, uh, verse 21, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Psalms 106, verse 36, They worship their idols, which led to their downfall. And I would probably say that that was just that. I didn't know where I was in life. I didn't know where I was in Christ. When I won, I was high as a kite, man. It was nothing better. When I lost, I was in a downfall, depression, you know, just having that rodeo being that false idol. But it probably took until I, I got around Alan Bach, Clay Cooper, uh, Corey Kuntz, there was a handful of guys out there rodeoing that, that really changed my perspective of where I was as a person. And I would have to say that, say, Alan Bach probably helped me the most on being able to identify, first of all, who God really was, because there was such a, a misinformation campaign, you know, that the devil runs. He's a great marketer yeah. on who God was and who he wasn't. And it probably came till I started identifying the fruit of the spirit to where I started understanding whose team was on who. And so when I started understanding Galatians 5, verse 19, when you follow the sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immortality, impurity, lustful pleasures, and uh, idolatry, is that how you say it? Adultery. Adultery? Yeah, it works. I like it, yeah. yeah just say it real fast and then you just sound good. <laughs> I did that the first sermon. <laughs> Hostility, <laughs> quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger. I don't know if anybody else struggled with that one. Nobody. Selfish ambition and just enviness, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. 
And it started giving me an idea of like, okay, whose team was on who? And, and what I meant by that is when I started being able to get around those guys that under, that it was just, a, there was a certain vibe about them. Mm -hmm. I was comfortable around them. Man, we talked and we talked, when we would talk, it was about encouragement and hopefulness. And it was just, there was such a different vibe. And I started understanding the, the fruit of the spirit and that, that fruit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against these things. And when I started understanding that, to me, it painted a picture on who was on whose team. When the devil was speaking, that was on that team. That was the deceitfulness, the, the anger, all those things that, that that's an emotion and a feeling. And then on this team, I started understanding where God's voice was and where the devil's voice was when I started deciphering the two. Because before that, I would have to say that everyone had the same jersey. I had no idea who, who was on whose team. Yeah. And it was, it was a very confusing time. Yeah. Yeah. What's cool about that young men that were out at the man's camp uh, Friday night, he shared about that. And if you remember, um, I don't remember which one of the guys that was talking about it, but we, we highlighted the importance of being Christ-like everywhere that you go. And that doesn't mean that you're beating people over the head with your Bible, but you should be able to walk in a room or you should be able to walk in your locker room. You should be able to walk into your rodeos or whatever that might be. And people see that there's something different about you. Again, not because you're acting holier than thou, but it's the fruits of the spirit. And I, I just think it's so cool that, that you're sharing that we just had this conversation with these young men of like, if you look like hell, like everybody else, and you act like hell, like everybody else, and then Sunday rolls around, like, hey, come to church. Why in the world would anybody want to serve the God that you serve? But when they see that you're set apart and different, um, and I love that you shared that about your friends. Like, they weren't beating you over the head with the Bible. They were living out of faith that they said they believed in, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's the stuff that, that is seen when you walk into the darkness. Nobody is impressed by all your knowledge, but what they are impressed by is a life that goes, man, I love that you said that. They were just something different. They had a different vibe about them. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just think that's such a cool testimony for us as believers. And maybe you've bought into this, well, I don't know enough about the Bible, or I, you'll never preach a sermon, or I'll never lead worship. Man, sometimes your presence in the darkness is all God's wanting and desiring. And, and to know that, that you've got these three, four dudes that are in your life that, that were that to you, that you can still circle back around to and go, I wanted to model my faith to theirs. Um, they probably didn't even know it at the time. They, they were probably just, man, I'm just being myself. And, and to see that, that impact, that's the kind of impact we make when we're operating in the Holy Spirit. To just go, God, I'm going to this rodeo, or God, I'm going to this church service, or God, I'm going to the Walmart, or God, I'm going to Taco Casa. Um, would you have me be a light in the darkness? And, and it's those moments that, that people see. Um, and, and I believe so many of our testimonies can go, my testimony goes back to Daniel Hancock, um, a dude that just lived out his faith who just oozed Jesus out of his life. He didn't, it wasn't his, oh my God, you could unpack that in the Greek. And I'm just so impressed. It was just like, the dude's real. He's, he loves his wife. He loves the Lord all the days of his life. And I wanted that because I never found that anything. And so I just think that's cool that you, um, that you hit on that. So you built this relationship uh, with the Lord. You're seeing whose team is on whose. You're, you're deciphering, okay, I got the Holy Spirit in this. And like, you're growing in your faith. Um, what did that look like when you got to a place in your faith journey to go, it's time for me to bow out? Like this, this whole uh, identity as a, as a team roper, um, I'm done with that. Like what did that recalculating uh, look like for you? Well, throughout my career, I was able to see a lot of um, basically results of what happens when that false idol has is, is led you. You know, I remember when I was, before I'd made the NFR, I was able to rope with one of the top guys, and he was a Hall of Famer and legendary roper. But everything was built on credit. Everything was built on an image. And everything was just so falsified by this false idol that well, I remember when we roped, he didn't, this was one of the first times he didn't make the NFR. And when we roped that summer, I remember all of a sudden his tractor disappeared then his truck disappeared, then his trailer disappeared. By the end of the year, his house was foreclosed, he lost his wife, and that stung. That was one of those things where I looked up to one of those guys and I watched his house that was built on sand just come crumbling down at the end of his career. 
And so while I was rodeoing, the one thing that I wanted to make sure of is that when, when I was rodeoing and Jackie and I was married, I came home every two weeks, every two to three weeks. I wanted her to know that this is what I do, but this is not who I am. I want to make sure that you understand rodeoing is what I do, but you're more important to me than that. And so really trying to make sure that I established the fact that I know where this is, but this is not going to take over my life. So I really tried to keep that curb strap real tight. You know, I didn't want that runaway horse, and I don't want that runaway career because the amount of times that I watched guys throughout their career, I remember one that stood out specifically was when a guy just put everything he had into a world title, everything. And when he got done, he was like, is this it? This is all this buckle means? I lost my wife, I lost my family, I lost my kids, I lost my home. This is all this is worth? And that, that rung true because that just was something that I wanted to make sure that I don't do that. Because it's real easy to do. Because like I say, when it's your passion, you're all in. I mean, you're, you're putting everything you have into it. But what I realized also was how fast things go. You know, when I first made my NFR, I bought my permit in 2090, or yeah, 1995. Sorry, that was a whole nother time. 1995, and I didn't make the NFR until 2005. So 10 years later, that part took a long time. But when I got to the NFR, man, I was just so ate up with it. And I was so happy that I finally made it. You know, I, I, I did a dirt angel in the head box <laughs> because I was, as a kid, I, I remember doing snow angels and dirt angels, and I just wanted that little kid to have that moment. And, you know, I got there early, and it looked nothing like it did on TV, and I just got in the head box before everybody got there, obviously, because I don't want to be that guy. But I just flopped down there and did a big old dirt angel, and I remember some guy that was putting the banners up that was getting ready for the rodeo. He's like, I think we have somebody doing a seizure. You know, I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> But it was just, I wanted to, I wanted to experience that because I, I never knew if I was going to make it ever again after that. You know, I mean, I, I, I dreamt about making the NFR once or twice, and that was going to be probably it for me. And I, what I realized on that first NFR was how fast it went. Yeah. I mean, my goodness. I remember nodding my head in the first round, and then I got my rope taken off at the back end, and I don't remember what happened. Like, it was such a blur. Like, I remember looking back at my partner going, did we win? Did we rope? Did we catch? Did I fall out? What happened? Like, I had no idea. I think it was the seventh round before actually I could understand, like, and, and comprehend. Like, that blank out phase was real. It was just so fast. Well, those 10 days were fast. And then at the end of those 10 days, it's like two more weeks, we go to Odessa. Like, the year starts right back over again. And I seen what that guy was talking about. I was like, this is it? This is all it is? Yeah. You know, I, I gave up my life and everything for this, and they're already talking about the next world champion. Yeah. You know, I spent my whole life getting to those 10 days and like a blink of an eye, it was done. And then here we are starting the next year. So I had a real good idea on how fast those things go. And, and it was a difficult transition when it was time like 10 NFRs later. The, the great thing about the fact of was going into my last NFR was it, what was tough about the decision was because I remember me and Jackie were talking about it and she was pregnant with Journey and we hadn't decided to name for her yet. And it w the hard decision was, was I had one of the best partners um, that I'd uh, you have to apologize. Sometimes his throat locks up for no reason, and I don't know why it does it. I pleaded with it, and sometimes it just does it, so I apologize for that. But I'd had the best partner that I had at that time that fit me. He lived right down the road, uh, Logan Medlin. I was roping with him. Um, I'd had the best horses that I'd ever had that I'd finally gotten put together. I was roping better at the end of my career than I roped my whole entire career. But keeping those, that curb strap tight, because when I talked to Jackie about it, and I said, well, is this it? Or should I do it again? You know, because I also remembered one time Patrick Smith talked about roping with the legendary roper himself. And he said, man, I'll just be happy if I can win the world one more time. And Patrick said, it was very hard to say this, but it was like, this guy was a legend. He's like, no, you're not. You're not going to be happy with one more time because there's always going to be that one more time. There's always going to be, well, I'll be happy if I can just do one more time. And I remembered that when we were trying to discuss on what my future held because, you know, you have to eventually tell your partner, are you in or are you out for next year? And 
when we were discussing it and she was pregnant with Journey and Breakaway and was just taken off. And so her career, she had been waiting for this moment her whole life. Well, at this point in time, this is my 10th NFR. I'd never dreamt in my life I would have made 10 NFRs ever. And so to me, it was like, I've got to do everything I wanted to do. And this is where you're at. And for both of us to try to do this, this doesn't seem sustainable for the husband I wanted to be or the father that I wanted to be. So it was an, an easy choice for me to, I'm, I'm okay with taking that next step for this next journey in my life. And that's, like I said, that's when we came up with Journey's name because that was a crossroad with where we were at to where she started full-time rodeoing and then I went down my path of, of, of where I'm at now. Yeah. And I think the cool thing about that story is that, and, and you and Jacobs both hit on this, that, that, that you saw an end in sight. You saw that you weren't going to be a, a team roper your whole life. Jacob saw that he's like, there's no way my body can sustain this. So he said, I always had an ending in that. And I think that's a great danger, especially. And so let's just take rodeo off the table now, because I know that there might be that, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm not in the rodeo. Um, I mean, you can put anything there. If we don't, if, if we're not looking at the bigger picture of, of eternity, um, like if all I, if my identity is in just preaching, uh, man, I'm going to be let down because um, I'm a fool to think y'all are going to still like me at, at 96 up here y'all yelling at y'all about Jesus. Like there has to be an end in that. And, and if you can't find an end to that thing that is in your story, then, then guess what? It's become an idol. It's become something that has become your identity. It's become something that has completely taken over your life. And I'm with you. I think you can have a, a joy about something. And a man, I love to play country music. I love, love, love it. Um, it's like my passion. It's the only thing I feel like I'm good at. Um, but I also had to get to an understanding. My dad helped me understand this years ago to go, Ryan, when you're 68 and you're overweight, nobody's going to hire you to play the piano. And, I'm, you know, but at 23, you're like, yeah, they will. And my dad's like, no, they won't. Like, and, and so I had to understand, like, man, there's got to be an end to that. Because, and, and then what, what it does is you begin to realize I'm worshiping this thing. I'm, I, this thing has become my idol. And so I think that could be said for, for anything that we bring to the table. And that's what I love that, that y'all are like, I saw this coming to an end. But I think the great danger is if we're only looking what my dad said, five feet out in front of you, you don't see that. All you see is that next buckle. All you see is that, oh, I'm going to go to this place and I'm going to play music. And all I see is, and, and then it, it leads to what we always refer to as Uncle Rico. You know, it's the 60-year-old that's still trying to play country music. Nobody hires, so he's playing at the Western Place down at Burleson. Like, I mean, that, that's ultimately what happens when this thing becomes our, our idol. And so, um, well, and I think, too, is, is passion has a, as a big part of, of a drive. And so... I knew that when at the end of my career that there's a certain lion inside of you that just drives you, that just makes you want to become the best, makes you want to be a great roper, makes you want to be a good horseman, and just that competition. And I, I knew I had that passion. And I knew that once I made that crossroads and when I was to push forward with my next purpose, I knew that if I could take that same lion mentality to it, that I don't care if it's rodeoing, I don't care if it's if it's whatever your passion is, you find that passion and you you attack it. Yeah. And you can keep that same drive. Mm -hmm. It just may be now a different outlook. Okay. It may be and now maybe now a different path. And it's to me that's what you can take a lot of a lot of me, but just don't take my purpose. Yeah. You know, you know, and your purpose evolves, it changes. There, there's I think there's there's uh, certain seasons, you know, that you go through. And, and to me, the, the, the rodeo world, to, to make a live in rodeo and that season had passed. Yeah. And so I had created this skill set since I was a tiny little kid to try to perfect this as good as I could, you know, handling a rope and, and being able to, to ride a horse and have horsemanship. And then to, you know, there's certain a mental game that that, that stuff acquires to. And it's like, is that skill set used in some other way? And so to be able to do the clinics and inspire young kids and to help other people, you know, find their passion with, with roping. It's, it's, it's been a great fit. It's just an, in another way. Yeah. So and can, can you hit on that? So, so you had, you know, you, your end came and, and you're championing your wife to go do her thing. You're being husband and dad. I hope some husbands and dads heard that. Um, and that just blessed my heart to hear. Um, me and Melissa have such a heart for marriage and there's so many marriages that are falling apart from no other place than, I, I, I'm just gonna blame the husband. So many times the husband doesn't step into that place to go, look, next to the Lord, you're the most important thing to me. 
Um, I'm going to tell you, that's a powerful, that's a powerful testimony in itself that, that more men need to be proclaiming. Uh, but just, so you did this thing, um, she's doing her thing, um, but, but can you also share how, just because that was the end of that chapter, um, in your recalculating how God was able to use your talents and your abilities moving forward, because it's cool how he used you post-rodeo. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, as we, I was really hoping you're going to get choked up before I did. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was glad that you humbled yourself in the sermon before where you did it first, and then I thought, well, I'll bail you out on this next part. But, but it's, it's one of those things now to where now, now how has God going to use me? Where is he going to put me in a spot to where, um, you know, the things that I had been through, how is that going to help shape and mold somebody that's, that's on their way up that maybe gone through some of the things that I did? And there's a clinic that Corey Koontz and I did in Hamilton, it was uh, the Champions for Christ clinic, and they called me out there to, to do that clinic, and a uh, great group of people, but there was 96 kids that attended this clinic, and it was free, and so I do a little bit over 40 clinics a year, and so when I show up to a clinic, when I show up at 9 o'clock, I'm ready. I'm on. You got me till 5 o'clock. I'm going to do everything I can where you get more than your money's worth. Like, I'm going to, we're going to dive into this. We're going to get after it. Well, when you got 96 kids and I think 48 of them were heading, you know, and you're trying to make sure everyone gets their money's worth and stuff like that, it's a lot to juggle. Like you talk about learning how to get creative, right? And finally, the, the pastor and the guy putting it on is like, Charlie, settle down. Settle down. Remember, this is free. Anything they get, they're going to get their money's worth. Yeah. And if they get anything at all, they're going to get their money's worth. And so it was kind of like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> I needed that. And he goes, look, you're just the bait. <laughs> you're here because these kids are passionate about team roping and anything that they get is going to help them in the arena what we're trying to get them here is we're trying to help them to where they understand there's more to it than team roping we're trying to help them out of the arena he said because you don't understand where a lot of these kids that come here a lot of them are hurting and he started going through all the things of like what these kids were dealing with and man, it, it just, it, it just, it hit me right between the eyes. You know, he said, some of these kids are hurt and, you know, some of these kids are abused. Some of these kids are physically abused, sexually abused. Um, you know, when we started saying that, oh, I'm telling you, my blood run cold mm -hmm. real hot. Oh man, like you, who would do that to a kid? Yeah. And so I actually had to give my testimony the next day. And so when he started telling me what these kids were going through, I was like, gosh, dang it. Like, I can give a pretty good surface level testimony. You know, something that I can just kind of talk to where this voice doesn't, this voice box don't lock up, right? But when he told me that, I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm gonna have to get real tomorrow. And so I started talking to him a little bit about it. And when I left there, I couldn't sleep that night because I know I have to give my testimony the next day. And I'm pleading with God all night, like, I don't want to do this. I, there's a certain little kid inside of me. I like to keep him down there a little bit. You know, there's certain things that I have in my story. I would really like to keep that there in that little box, closed up, locked, padlocked, and covered up, sure. right? And so I keep pleading with God all night. Well, he ain't saying nothing. He's saying it without saying it, right? He's like, and I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. You know, I don't want to go there. And... The next morning I get there and I'm talking to the guy that's putting this on, the pastor, I said, look, I've got a story, but I, I don't want to tell it. Like I can give a testimony, but I don't want to go there. I don't want to uncover this. He goes, well, depends on how real you want to get. I'm like, don't you tell me real. Come on, man, that's like daring you, right? Yeah. Don't dare me. Like, the, what's the one thing I want to be? I want to be real. I've always wanted to be real. He said, well, it depends on how real you want to get. And when the pastor walked off, I'm like, all right, one more thing, one more thing. I said, what keeps this thing from locking up? <laughs> Because I, I said, I can't tell a story when this throat keeps locking up. It's one of the reasons I don't like telling this story. And he says, oh, son. He said, that just means it's real. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and so as I start talking to these kids, and I knew that, like, as a kid, when I was that age, you couldn't talk down to me. If you talk down to me, I'm just going to ignore you. I'm going to walk away. But if you get eye level... different type of communication, yeah. you know? So I had to bring that kid out again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
I did not want to talk about it, you know. You know, and I had to start talking about things that I went through. And, uh, you know, when you have a mom and a dad and everything's separate and, you know, you don't feel loved, and you're an insecure kid, and uh, you thought me telling this story the first time, I'd be able to tell yeah. it again the second yeah. time without it, but it's, no. it's uh, one of those things that I haven't learned how to tell this story without that happening, but, you know, I didn't know how to deal with failure. I didn't know how to deal with um, letting people down. I didn't know how to deal with criticism. I, it, it, just, it struck me to my core. And so I didn't know how to deal with things. So when I was growing up, suicide was a, was a battle. And it, it, it's a mental, it's a mentalness. You know, it, it's something that's inside your head. For me, it was because I didn't know how to deal with the defeat. I didn't know how to deal with the agony. You know, just that, that stuff that's on the inside that you just, you, you want it to be done. And, you know, when you're talking about having a gun in your mouth and having a rope around your neck, and, uh, you remember your mom taking you to church and you started hearing that voice it wasn't quiet or I mean it wasn't yelling at you it wasn't deceitful it was that voice that came inside of you and all of a sudden you just you, you felt different and you pulled the gun out of your mouth you, you took the rope off around your neck and it was that voice that everything's going to be okay now I know who that voice is now, but at the time it was just, it was the spirit, I could feel it. It was, it was, if it, my, my mom didn't take me to church, I would have never probably felt that. And so when I'm telling these kids the things that I battled with and the things that I learned how to get over, now you look at me now, no, that thought never crosses my mind. Kids, you think I'm gonna leave my kids? Dead wrong. Um, you know, that was something I had to learn how to get over. And I always tell those kids that are dealing with that is like, thank God I didn't do that. You know, look at what I've become. Look at, look at the things that I accomplished. Look at my family. Look at my wife. I mean, you know, look at the things I never would have got to experience if I couldn't deal with adversity, if I couldn't deal with loss. And if it wasn't for God, I would have never learned how to deal with it. And now, don't get me wrong, you know, there's still frustrations and aggravations. It's not because you give your life to Christ, everything's going to be okay. But he helps you learn how to deal with those when you find that, that trust in, in something that's greater than yourself. You find that trust in something that's greater than rodeo yeah. and that everything's going to be okay. And, you know, like I said, when I got done with that um, testimony, I had kids coming and crying at me and I'm like I'm not a pa I'm not a pastor I'm not a counselor like I don't <laughs> but but I but I spoke to him in a high level to where they could relate to me and I'm like so that's why that's why you're supposed to give testimonies yeah I mean it was one of those things where God was like all right now you see what I'm saying even though I didn't have to say it you get it now yeah I'm like all right and you know when I was able to talk about the the battles that my dad and I had amongst each other you know like I said he grew up in that loving drink and fighting cowboy era that was an that was an idol you know that that sinful nature that was an an idol of of cowboys in, a, in an era that was looked up to and and he he was right down that mold and when i started changing my life when i started hanging around the right guys you know walking and seeing with trevor brazil and how he carried himself and what was the cause for that alan bach and a lot of those guys you know i got alan bach baptized me in his water trough at home and I started, they, they uncovered the things that, who God was. They, they started letting me know where, where the devil was, who is an unbelievable marketer. Sure. And I started trying to, win, trying to win God's heart. I started trying to change my life. Well, what that ended up doing was, I didn't realize that was transforming my dad. Sure. Who, him, him and I, if anyone that's ever grew up in Oregon, everyone knows that... <laughs> 
that was a thing. You know, you couldn't mention me without mentioning my dad. You couldn't mention my dad without mentioning me. You know, there was a battle that everybody in that whole state knew. You know, it wasn't nothing for us to get in a fist fight right there dang near in the middle of the arena. You know, that was a thing that him and I had. And when I started going to church and transforming my life, he started going to church. And, you know, what was crazy was, you know, my dad has a real funny sense of humor. And he says, you know, I've seen where you made the short round of Pendleton. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go to church the next day. And it seems how you're here. Do you have anywhere else to go after that? I said, no. I actually have a couple days off. He said, oh, well you know, I'm going to get baptized. I seen where you, you got baptized. He said, I, I want to get baptized. I said, oh, I'll be there. I'll be there. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, seems how you're there. You're already there. You know, I'm, I'm kind of new to this and, you know, I don't know the pastor real well and I'm kind of a little uncomfortable in this thing. He goes, you know, since you're there, would you mind baptizing me? I said, you want me to baptize you? He goes, yeah. Yeah, I'll, bapt- I'll be there, dad. I'll be there. And when you say you never know who you're going to, you know, inspire. And so my dad has a real funny sense of humor. And so we have him in the the trough over there and kind of just exactly like that. And he's in his little skibbies in his his (laughs) white shirt. And he gets over there and I'm helping him down. And the pastor starts saying the son, the Holy Ghost. And he's got his nose plugged and I've got the back of his shoulders. And I go to drop him down. And for out of the blue, Uh these hands come up there and grab the side of the water trough. And he comes up and he looks me right in the eye and he goes, now, I know we've had some beef in the past, but this is no time to get even. <laughs> and just the whole congregation just, you talk about a guy who could break the ice in the room. And, you know, I, I baptized my dad out of all the things that we went through. And, you know, we, we still struggled. Uh, we still, you know, kind of butted heads a little bit. But I remembered it. It was in August of 2012. He had cancer, and I was coming home, and I was trying to come home and spend more time with him as much as I could. And he was a great horseman. He was an unbelievable horseman, way better than me. And I was watching him piddle around with this two-year-old, you know, picking his feet up, and, you know, oh, come on now. No, no, you got this. You know, just encouraging this horse. And this horse would kick at him and almost hit him over the head and dented his hat. He's like, oh, now, come on now. You stop that. You know, just, just as patient as can be. And well, I was struggling with some stuff with riding, and I asked him to help me one day. And it was just one of those things that it kind of magically happened. It wasn't strategic. It was just, Dad, can you help me with something? Because when I'm telling you my dad could ride around in his horse, he could heal on this horse in a halter, and he could just pick him up with two fingers, and this sucker would just soften up. I'm telling you, just amazing at just how great he could ride a horse. Well, I was struggling with some stuff softening my horse up in the corner to make my steers a little bit more healable for those of you the team rope you understand what i'm saying especially healers and i was asking him about some advice and it didn't take me but i think 15 minutes where all of a sudden i can't believe you can't figure this out oh my gosh i can't believe you ever, you know just same stuff come rolling back right well i start laughing and i was like well, that didn't that didn't take me long and uh And I told him, and it was just something that just spoke over me. And I can't, and I remember to this day, I said, Dad, if you'll show me the same patience that you showed that little two-year-old, and you encourage me and show me the same patience as you did with that horse, I promise you I'll get it. And the horsemanship was something that actually related to him where he understood it. And that was the last argument we ever had to this day. And... Like I said, I remember it to to this day. And he went from being my biggest critic to my biggest fan. And when I was able to speak to those kids about the things that I had been through and what I was able to speak to the parents as well, I think that day five or six dads got baptized by their kids. And uh, like you say, you never know where God's going to put you. And... I kind of seen it that day. I seen the importance of being able to tell your story and being real and as much as it locks your throat up. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's one of those voices when God says, go ahead and do it, just punch through it and you'll figure it out. So. Sure. And what I love so much about that is, and I hope we got, we were talking about this in between service. We got so many young people here. This isn't just for the young people, but, but I hope that the younger generation hears this because I think there's the, it, it, I don't think, I know that it's a great lie of the enemy of um, that when we hit end of chapters of our lives, then, 
then we're just done and over with, right? And, and we find ourselves in these dark places of, I'm not, it's not worthy to live. It's not, I'm not good at this no more, whatever it might be. And what I hope you see through his story is that sometimes God, all the times he's, he's changing the chapters of our life. It's like a book. Our life is ultimately like a book and we're going to hit the end of chapters and we're going to turn the pages to things that's going to look different. And we got a lot of college kids. Some of y'all approaching your junior, senior years, like you're going to turn a page and life's going to look different. It's not bad, but what I hope you see through this story is even though that, that season ended, um, for his rodeo, what, what God did is began to use him then for another plan and another purpose. And I think about these kids who gave their life to Jesus that you got to, to, to speak into. Like, you're so right. Had you ended your life as a young kid because you couldn't get your brain around the insecurities and all the things, then that doesn't happen. And so I'm trying to be better about, you know, seeing behind that curtain. God, would you show me behind the curtain the bigger story? Um, if I never preach another sermon. I'm gonna, my throat's going to lock up here if I never preach another sermon. Um, and this is a question I ask the Lord all the time to gauge my own heart. Am I okay with that? I read an article this week of a pastor who literally lost his voice, like literally could not talk anymore. Um, and I'm reading this and I'm like, man, what if that happens to me? And, and immediately what I begin to see is, crap, I've put all my chips in to my identity as, as a pastor. And I had to get to this place of going, God, would you still love, I mean, would I still love you and pursue you um, if my voice was to go? And I was to never preach another sermon. And, and I think that's where we, there's just a, a good filter to, for all of us. I don't care if we're talking about rodeo, music, CEO, whatever. Um, man, that you'd be able to ask yourself, God, if this chapter changes and I never run track again, if I never, whatever that deal is that, that God has you do and that passion that you have, if I never do this again, are you still enough? And, and I, man, that's a, that's a hard question to be able to ask and, and, and answer honestly. Now, we can give the church the answer and hear, God, you're enough. But, but, but is it enough when, when you're sitting at home watching the NFR? Is it enough when I'm sitting out in a church listening to someone else preach? Is it enough when somebody else is beating your records on the track? Um, and, and I think that's where the rubber meets the road of, Holly, I've made this thing an idol. But, but I hope that through your story, what we're seeing is just because it's the end doesn't mean that it's the end. You're right. You just take that passion into, you know, you're, you took it into these clinics that you're doing and you're investing in these kids. I'm not playing Merle Haggard songs anymore. I'm playing worship songs now. So it's like, it's not that these things are over. It's just like, hey, instead of doing this, let's do this now. And, and I think when you start to live life through those lens, then it's not like, oh my God, I'll never do this again. You know, it's just like, hey, God has something different for me. And, and the more that I'm seeing that, the more I'm resting and just having a peace in my life to go, God, as long as I get you at the end of this deal, I'm good. If, if, and that's scary to even say, but if I did lose my voice, if I never played another song, um, my identity is in you. And I know that even if I don't have a voice, you'll use me some way. And to see that you're tapping into that, to go, I may not go to another NFR, but God's using me to invest in these kids. And, and the, the reality is just loving children's ministry, kids' ministry is that that you're probably saving lives from, from not doing the things that you talked about doing just because you're able to share your story. And I just think, man, that's a, that's a powerful, um, powerful thing. And so um, I guess we'll go to the last question for time's sake. But uh, for that young person that's here uh, today, I'm gonna, I don't say young person, for that person that is here today, rodeo or not, okay? Because I'm going to catch them slack, and we, we have too many rodeo folks up here. So, um, so I'd like for you to address this just across the board, um, rodeo or not, what would be some advice that you'd give to that person, whatever that thing is that they're doing in their life, um, to, to just be zoned into that and make sure that they got their priorities in line when it comes to those things? Well, I think rodeo or not, like I say, rodeo is just another metaphor for your passion. You know, no matter what you're trying to do, if you're passionate about something, it's just got to stay somewhat in check. And like in rodeo terms, we talk about keeping that curb strap tight, but it, it, it always seems like it continues to keep evolving on, on the amount of distractions that happen. And it's, it's got to be the hardest now more than ever. You know, these phones is TikTok. TikTok is so distracting, and I'm not saying stay off of it. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the things that God has got distractions. You know, look how, how, how hard is it for the Bible to keep up with TikTok? You know, is, do you know how hard it is to read? And you know how easy it is to watch something really funny? And so it, it's the distractions and the things that, that 
can keep you distracted is, is so much more now. You got to be real careful on what you eat. You know, there's there's so many, the devil's coming at you in so many more different directions now. And it, it could have always been that way. It just maybe now that he's not even scared to show his head. That's right. But knowing where the distractions are, who you're hanging out with, I mean, that's a big one. You know, the five guys you hang out with is going to be probably where you're going to be in the next five years. And so can you get around that community? Can you get around those people? Can you get around the guy that's telling you what you don't want to hear? That's right. Can you get around... You know, the, the, the girl that's saying, look, I know you don't want to hear this, but I think that you're going down the wrong path. Sure. Can you get around enough people that are real that's going to be real with you? Because they love you. You know, knowing the difference between love and lust is a huge camouflage that even I've struggled with for a long, long time. Because, you know, you, you got to get around that realness. You have to have around people right there that, that love you. People that love you are going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. That's good. And that's a big one. And I think it's very hard at, at a young age to be able to, to decipher that. And so I really encourage the community where you guys are at. I mean, you're here right now. So, yeah, I can see where I'm proud of all you guys because you're taking the, the best step. This is a great church, a great environment that you've produced. And, and just thank you for what you're doing here for, for all of us. Yeah, so I thank you. you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah, and I, man, I, I say that all the time. Next to the Lord, the single most important thing in my life is who I'm hanging out with. I mean, to this day, I love Jesus with all my everything, but I could go hang out with my Hellraiser friends. And over a period of time, I'd, I don't want to say that I'd be doing that again, but I sure don't want to test those waters. And so I'm still so, I just love that. That's, that's good wisdom. And I hope young people, you are as good as the people you hang out with and, and you will mold into them um, whether you like that or not. And so, um, so that said, man, can we give Charlie a big hand for being here uh, this morning? Um, so I wanted to wrap this up with just because the central takeaway from this talk is idolatry, um, things that we can just make idols. And so the challenge for us as we close is what is it in your life? Um, it may be rodeo but it may be music, it may be your job, it may be whatever, track, it may be, I'm picking on all the people that I just know uh, that come to my mind firsthand, but what is it in your life that, that, that maybe, just maybe, you've elevated above the Lord? And listen, only you know the answer to that, and, and that's what this time of worship is going to be, you just asking the Lord, um, God, would you reveal my heart to me? Is there anything uh, in me that, that I've elevated above you? Is there something in my life that's more important um, than you, and, and then a practical thing that can help this, because um, we always, I, wanna, I want you to leave here with the practicals, not like, oh, suck, and I'm, I made everything an idol. I want you to be able to leave here and go, I saw that, but how can I wage war against this? And, and my answer is always going to be the same, the Word of God. Romans chapter 12, and, what, and verse 1 and 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and that can be a coffee cup scripture, but that can also be a, a plea and a charge from our hearts to go, God, every single day, God, am I being conformed to this world? And, and if I am, would you help me renew my mind? Would you help me renew this thing that's going on so I could keep my focus on the things that matter so that if the phone call comes, so that if I decide my career's done, so that if I decide, you know, that the chapter changes, my faith is gonna be content. But because I've, I've spent every day going, I don't want to be conformed to the world, and I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so as Morgan makes her way up here, um, this is the challenge um, for you guys. As you sit out here today, I, I want you to just simply ask the Lord, what is it in my life that, that I've put in front of, of you, God? And would you reveal my heart to me? And then allow that conviction to fall. I always say, man, be okay with conviction. I love that he talks about the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit, right? If you're convicted about that thing, man, praise the Lord. Um, because the enemy, you're right, he is so sly. And, and you can look up 20 years into something and go, man, he's had me fooled for a long time. And maybe that's a story of some. But we want to challenge you. Just have a time to just go, God, what is it in my life that I need to, to put lower than you and elevate you higher? Um, I want you to be the most important thing in my life. Um, because I'm just going to tell you, as a pastor, and Melissa can testify to this as well, um, we are starting to see the simplicity of, of faith in a manner of this. Um, when God is at the top of everything, when your relationship with the Lord, and, and please don't let this fall in a cliche place, but, but if your relationship with the Lord is the most important relationship in your life, everything's going to flow from that. Um, will there be sucky days? You bet there will. Man, will there be sucky seasons? You bet there will. 
but will you be able to wake up in the morning and go, God, you're good? And the answer is yes. Will you love your wife different? Yes. Will you love your husband different? Yes. Will you raise your kids different? Will you rope steers different? Yes. I'm just telling you, we are learning that, that when God is the most important in your life, to go, God, if I get you at the end of this and nothing else, then I'm good. Man, that is a good place to be because the opposite we have learned to be true as well. That, that when we take God out of the place that he needs to be first and foremost in our life and we put him down here, um, that, that's where we see divorce. That's where we see addiction. That's where we see chaos. That's where we see families imploding. And so this is my challenge, man. Maybe you're here today and, and you're that, that prodigal son of Luke 15. And you're squandering your, your, your wealth and reckless living, it says in Luke 15. And then could you just fix your eyes, eyes back to the Father? But because the reality is we got a good God. He loves us so much. It says in Luke 15 that, that when he came to himself, he came out of the pig pen and he made his way towards the home. And the Father wasn't waiting on him to get home. The Father ran to him. And, and maybe someone just needs to hear that today. Maybe you're, you're realizing just in this challenge in itself, you're going, golly, I've put all these other things in and I'm miserable, and I've, I've been fighting for this buckle, or I've been fighting for this time, or I've been fighting for a name, and I'm just tired, and I'm exhausted. I just want to come home. Um, man, we serve a good God that meets us right where we are. And so maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I mean, we always want to give an invite to just go, hey, there's some people up at the front that want to have a conversation with you. The Bible is clear that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not only do we get saved, not only do we get to stand in eternity forever and ever, um, 10,000 years from now talking about today, but you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that convicted Charlie, that started to show him the importance of, of what we're doing with our life, that, that's convicting us of sin. Like, we get the Holy Spirit. Um, you get that gift in salvation. And so if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, we want to give you an invitation to do that, to come have a conversation with someone. Um, and for everyone else, man, I just want this time of worship to just simply be, God, would you reveal my heart to me? I want you to just pray that prayer. And could it be, and could it be that, that we've elevated things of this world on top of him? And could we just have a time of repentance? Could we have a time of just laying this at a bloodstained cross and know that we can be forgiven in that? Listen, I'll, I'll confess more times than not, more times than not, I've got to go, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've elevated ministry above you. I'm sorry that I've elevated things that seem right and good over you. And I'm going to tell you, there's, a, there's power in that prayer. And because the Holy Spirit is so good to go, we good, we good, right? And, and getting us back in that lane that we need to operate in. And so that's a challenge that's before us. But let's pray, and we'll see what the Lord does in this time. Father, we love you. And God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you. For testimonies, as Charlie said, Lord, I don't, I don't think any of us realize the power in just sharing our story. For far too long in the church, it's just been the, the guy in the suit and tie standing behind a giant pulpit, hollering at everybody and how they suck and they don't do anything right. And, and I think so often we just, we forget the power of just sitting on a front porch with someone and sitting at a clinic or in a coffee shop to go, Look, I've been where you are. I've gone through the things that you've gone through. Let me tell you how Jesus wrecked my story and stepped into my story and changed and transformed my story. And so, Father, I pray that that would be a challenge for all of us to, as Charlie said, it's hard to talk about some of this stuff. Some of us have gone through atrocious things. Some of us have testimonies that we don't like to bring up. Um, but, God, I'm, I'm finding also that that you send people to us so that we can share our stories. And I, and I pray that, that we as a, as a body of believers would get out of this mindset and mold that, that, that this is just Sunday morning where the preacher does all that, but there's a calling on all of our lives to go and, and share, yes, the good news of the gospel, but also share what you're doing in our story. Because God, just as, as Charlie can connect with those kids at these clinics, I'll never be able to connect with them. Um, and so will you have us all in a different lane and, and I pray that, that we'd see that today. Uh, Father, for those of us that are in a lane that, that maybe we've made that thing that you've gifted us as an idol, um, God, could we find repentance in that today? Could we lay that down at the cross today, Lord? 
the very thing that you have gifted us to do, so many times we can take it and we make it about ourselves and we can make it about our names and we can make it about our fame. We see King David do it. We see so many do it, Lord. And, and I just pray that if that would be anybody's story, that, that we could find a place of repentance today. And God, maybe that's a, a family coming and praying together. Maybe it's a soul just coming to the altars and, and laying that down at your feet. But Lord, I, I just pray that repentance would happen. Um, I, I truly believe it's repentance that's going to lead our nation to revival. And so I just pray that we would just put our hearts before you, God. That we would just be challenged with that simple prayer. God, what is it in my life that I've elevated over you? Could it be that we've lost our first love and we've made it about all the things that we do? And so, Father, I just pray that your spirit would move in this place. That you would do what only you can. Would you bring us back to our first love? And God, as you move in the midst of this place, would you convict hearts? God, if there would be anybody that is here today that has never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord, maybe they're just here because they heard Charlie's going to share his story. I pray that they would encounter Jesus today in a real way, Lord. And so, Father, we just ask you to move. We ask you to do what only you can. We love you. We praise you and we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's see what the Lord's up to this morning.